Welcome back to the Cult House Podcast. I'm your host, the scholar of spite and the Saturday Night Delight, Roger Riddell. Joining me today, he is the vocalist for Zealot, RIP, the sampler for Pig Destroyer, and the drummer for Hatebeak, which if you didn't know, <laughs> is a band that is fronted by a parrot. He is Blake Harrison. How are you doing today, Blake? Hey, good. There's a little uh, edit right there. So the drums for Hatebeak are programmed, so... Mark and I basically do all of it. We do a little programming each, uh, right? Play bass, play guitar, whatever we need. But it's, it's good enough. Fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> you know, I've always uh, kind of wondered about Hate Beak because uh, I didn't know <laughs> if the parrot was actually real. <laughs> it is. However, we don't own it. Um, <laughs> so it's a buddy of ours, and uh, his now ex wife owns it. So uh, we do have a lot of recorded, hours of recorded, uh, quote unquote, vocals from it. So if we were to do another uh, small record, like a split or an EP, we, we, was, we would still have enough material for that. Yeah, but uh, basically what you're saying is that Waldo is effectively retired. Yeah, I mean, we want to go hunt it down. Uh, and to be quite <laughs> honest, you know, even though with this huge record boom, those records aren't really selling. Uh, there might be a big thing for Heat Peak, a big, uh, let's say, advertisement piece. Uh, but we'll see. Um, you know, it's also a thing that Mark lives in Jersey now. So it's not as easy as us to do the stuff as when he lived in Maryland. Um, so, and you know, when we get together, we don't always want to work on music. And so, you know, I mean, it's also kind of like, how much of that stuff can you listen to? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's uh, there's that whole period there uh, around the time that you all did that, where uh, there's kind of uh, a little run of like bands that had animal vocalists, because uh, I remember like Caninus and all of that too. We were the first. Uh, Caninus, we actually did a split with Caninus on Reptilian Records. Yeah, it yeah, sold out like crazy fast. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I remember when that came out and uh, uh, at the time it was, it was one of those things where uh, it was something that I would put on when I was like really stoned. Yeah, I mean, it's also a thing like I love a novelty seven inch. Um, I've got uh, some of the anal Trump stuff. Uh, I have a old, old record called Grudge. I was kind of making fun of Straight Edge. Um, I have this super group that no one really knows what's who's in it. Hardcore band called Gabriel Biscuits, and they take classic hardcore brands and turn them into homosexual, positive homosexual songs. So uh, instead of nailed in the nailed to the X, it's nailed in the ass. <laughs> uh, and it's supposedly it's like all famous hardcore people, but I never been able to find out who did that sort of thing. So, you know, that was part of it is just kind of have fun, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, earlier today, I was talking to our pal Stavros from the Atlas Moth and, yeah. uh, you know, texting back and forth with him. And I told him that I was going to be talking to you tonight. And uh, he just said, uh, talk to him about this dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stavros, you rascal. I would talk to him about my dick. I don't know if you ever heard that. It's a guy from Boston who, gets karaoke songs of famous songs and just says my dick the entire time <laughs> so like he is a, uh it's a great record it's hilarious uh like kiss is on my list by uh hall notes is one i can remember and he just sings my dick through it to the same belly uh <laughs> i'll try to, i'll try to remember to send it to you when we're done yeah i'll uh i'll check that out because uh i had no reference for what the joke was whenever he sent that that's not he's just saying his dick just be like, hey, don't. 
Um, so yeah, before we get uh, too much deeper into this, uh, you uh, recently beat cancer. Uh, what was that like? Um, what was the beating part like, or what yeah. was? Well, that, I mean, that's that's a big amorphous question. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I got lucky. It wasn't that terrible. Um. For me, uh, they have a specialized medication that's really good for melan stage melanoma, which is what I had, um, and a couple other cancers. I think it's really good for lung cancer. And as a thirty-year smoker, certainly doesn't hurt. Um. I'm currently like very very close to quitting but it's really tough um but yeah so the process wasn't too bad it did get a little sick and was hospitalized there's two medications that they could join together and it really fucked me up um but we were aware that i had the potential to do that so i was in the hospital right before the decimal metal and beer fest and it was really touch and go um so I was in the hospital for three days so i think it was about four days before i had to go to the festival so, yeah, it was a little, it was a little rough, but uh, you know, it was a huge relief. I still have a lot of debt from that. Um, I'm currently unemployed, uh, but you know, I'm starting to pick back up and get a little contracting work here and there. So, you know, it'll all work out providing quit smoking and get back in the gym. Um, the medication is really kind of jacking my stomach up these days, which is a very known side effect. So the next trip is to the GI doctor and see if I can, you know, kind of change that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, because, um, you know, I kind of knew that all of, uh, the cancer stuff was going on. So it was, uh, from my end, uh, I thought it was just, like, really cool to see that you were still out there, like, doing all this stuff, like, putting out a Zealot RIP album, uh, doing the Decibel Fest and all of that. Well, I mean, fortunately for me, it didn't really affect me. It was located kind of in my armpit and uh you know it was just kind of it just kind of shrunk i mean the medication does mess me up but i love performing i love the band so much that it would take a lot to get me to not perform um not too long ago uh we played the auto bar and i was having a lot of issues in my stomach stirring up constantly couldn't really keep food down um so that was kind of rough because I felt like I had to puke the entire time on stage, but I pulled it off. Uh, you know, hold on. I just dropped one of my earpods. You're not using this video, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the video is uh, the video is going to be part of it, but uh, uh -oh, I should get it around off. that. <laughs> oh, I just want to hold it up so I don't look fat. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not really touch and go. I have my good days and my bad days, but fortunately my bad days aren't terrible, you know? So, it's uh pretty good, um, all things considered, you know. So uh, here's warning to everyone: go get, go to the dermatologist, get checked out. This could have been avoided had I I'd done that probably. So yeah, uh, I mean, you know, at the very least, you've uh you've avoided adopting a cancer as the pit slogan. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it wasn't really necessarily ever uh, worrisome to me because my oncologist, uh, he was just like, I was like, is there anything to worry about? And he's just like, no. he laughed. He's like, no, you know, he's like, we got it. And this stuff doesn't work. There's a really solid plan B. So it's really not an issue. So I just got to keep going to dermatologist and quit those cigarettes, but I'm down to less than one cigarette a day. So. Yeah, and so uh, you put out an album with Zealot R.I.P. last year, uh, The Extinction mm -hmm. of You. And uh, as someone who's a member of what is basically a super group, how much do you hate the term super group? <laughs> <laughs> so much. Uh, I don't think that that's ever really true. Um, you know, me and Sly Bomb are, are in well-known bands, and our drummer was in a well-known band uh, a little while ago. And their bass player was in a semi-well-known band, or still kind of is. I think they're pretty part-time these days. But uh, yes, that's a terrible name. Um, I never think about it that way. Uh, I never think about myself or anyone in Big Sur or anyone, um, you know, kind of on the same level as rock stars. Uh, it's a very small scene, um, and though it's getting pop more popular. Uh, you know, I'm not a rock star. I have to work. Uh, I don't have a Lamborghini, 
know, <laughs> it's not though, you know, the, the record industry, the music industry is not the eighties where you can just put out a, a record and make a ton of money or even the nineties when there was uh, a lot of independent bands made a lot of money. You can sell records these days, but nowhere near the amount that you were able to in the nineties and Spotify, we already know it doesn't pay shit. So, you know, I think the industry will level out somehow. So artists are, are kind of uh, compensated a little bit better. But, you know, we're just in a time where this stuff is new and everyone's trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. yeah I mean, I do think that um, it's interesting that for as much as there's that trade off of uh, you don't really put out the album now and like make a ton of money off of it. But it's also easier now than ever to get your material out there in front of people. Oh, my God, dude. I mean, in the 80s and early 90s, you know, I would like look at the thanks list on the terrorizer world downfall record and be like okay they thanked all these bands i'm gonna go check them out or danny Wilker, uh you know being in nuclear assault and then brutal truth he's a walking billboard for so many bands every picture of him, he was wearing a different band shirt and it checked them all out i mean i got burned a couple times but i also found some really great stuff and you know even now, I try to do that in interviews or in pictures. Um, I try to promote bands I think is great, but it doesn't always translate to people checking them out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's cool though that there's like so many more outlets though. I guess because you can just be like uh, someone. I mean, you can just yeah. Google grindcore and YouTube. Yeah, you know, yeah, or whatever the fuck we are nowadays. I don't consider us a pure grindcore band anymore, and I don't think any of us really do. Um, yeah, I think that ship kind of sailed after Prowler or Terrifier, but you know, we like to challenge ourselves and write different records because it would be boring for us to write the same records. I feel like I keep going off on tangents, but you know, it's uh, that's all good. But um, as far as uh, doing vocals in Zealot RIP, was uh, was this like the first time that you? had done the vocalist uh, kind of thing? No, there's a local grind band called Triac. And uh, I was actually the second singer, Rich from Drugs of Faith, was the first singer for a little tiny bit. And then they got me. So um, that was a long time ago. So my voice has definitely changed. And uh, with the cancer and the cigarettes, I'm not in the same shape I was. So I'm working on trying to get that back. Uh, I really do like it. Um, it's like a great outlet for my anger and frustration. Um, I mean, just screaming at people and like being, getting paid for it is very therapeutic, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always thought it was interesting that um, the average person probably thinks that it's easy to just like scream, you know, like that, no. but uh, you do have to have your voice in like a certain shape before you can do it well and like not feel like your like throat is shredded. Yep, and absolutely. Uh, the Zealot set is 20 minutes, and the Pigster set is 45 to an hour. And there's no way I could pull 45 minutes to an hour off. No way. You know? And there's some online comments about JR for Pigster that he doesn't sound the same. Yeah, he's 45 years old. You know? <laughs> like, I want to be able to tell those kids, like, just wait, it's going to happen to you. But, you know don't really respond to stuff on the internet <laughs> yeah i mean even uh even people who sing like you know normal or whatever uh like danzig like their their voices change over time oh, absolutely yeah i mean rob halford is a great example he had such a strong voice I mean, you just can't hit those high notes anymore i mean a fantastic vocalist but i mean he's what's late 60s early 70s you know yeah i mean you can't expect you can't expect that uh and it is tough, you know, it's tough to pace your breathing. Um, you know, you really have to practice. You can't just go and scream until mic. You really have to practice because it's more like getting your breath down where you can and knowing how to do that and keeping it consistent. You know, you can't just go and, yes, you're right. If uh, I had someone from the audience scream into the mic with me for Zell, they would peter out in 30 seconds, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, because like so much of it isn't just from like your throat either. Like a lot of it's projecting from like it's got to be from it's got to be from your gut. You got to push out. Your throat is just a tube. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the first thing I learned about that. Is uh, actually Rich from Drug the Faith told me he's like, you know, push from here. Like pretend like you're having a baby, but the other way. <laughs> and that, that's kind of like the best advice I've ever gotten. Um, you know, there's times I, I kind of go a little hard and try to, you know, I try to not reel it in, but I have to, or I won't be able to talk or I won't be able to finish the set. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's gotta make it a little bit more difficult too, though, uh, with the stomach issues that you were having, uh, from, from your cancer treatment <laughs> as well. Well, fortunately I haven't played a zealot show or we haven't practiced all since that's been going on. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's not just that. We're writing new material. Um, and, you know, if my stomach was bothering me, I would just kind of talk my lyrics to get the rhythm and the pacing down. Uh, it's a process, you know. A lot of times I uh, kind of just scream in a pattern just to see how I'm going to lay my lyrics out. And a lot of it seems like a lot of people do that. But, um, you know, that's just part of it. Yeah. yeah, and uh, you all also uh, had a, a beer come out uh, called Ambush Predator to promote the new album. Uh, that nope. was with DC Brow, right? Correct. Yeah. The second beer for Zella, actually. Uh, we had a beer release in November, right before COVID really hit. Um, and we did it, god damn, I can't remember the brewery off him, uh, with a brewery from Virginia. Um, I want to say uh, Victory Brewery or Champion, I think. Um, so, you know, it, it's that kind of stuff is just a really good. Like, we, we've known the DC Brow guys forever. Um, I've known them for, I can't even remember, probably 10, 12 years. Uh, so working with them was great. It's just like kind of a good way to advertise your band. But... Uh, you know, a lot of bands have beers now. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of been like the, I guess, sort of the big trend for uh, for promoting new music now. For a while, um, yeah. You know, and to me, it's cool, but it gets less exciting. I like to do new stuff instead of the stuff I've already done. Um, but you know, like with Pig Destroyer, we work with Three Floyds, and they're so good to us. And she is so great, man. If they say, hey, do we want another beer? I'm like, do what you want, you know? Yeah, I mean, at least the the beer route makes sense. Uh, do you remember when Motorhead had like a wine? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this, wine is not what I associate with that band. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw somebody the other day that was trying to do like a band. Had a, it wasn't like a band I would like, like, I don't want to say five finger, five finger death, death punch, but it was something like that. Like one of those big quote unquote metal bands. Um, and they were doing a gin. And I was like, who the fuck is this marketed to? <laughs> like half of your crowd is 15 year olds. Like, <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, that stuff is cool for fans. Uh, Pig Stir made a hot sauce and I had it limited to 50 bottles. Um, because it's not really a money grab. It's just something fun to do, you know? I mean, um, there's some bands but, though where I think you, you could get a lot of mileage out of a hot sauce for some bands. Like uh, if Anal kind of done that. Yeah. Um, there's a I'm lot of jokes with, that can tie to that. I'm friends with Kyle from Sword, man. And their hot sauce was fucking amazing. And every time he comes through town, I'm like, yo, what's up? And he hands me three bottles. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with beer. The beer, uh, the first couple of bands to do it got a lot of mileage. And then, like, the first underground band I remember doing it was uh, Municipal Ways. Because Dave is such a beer nerd. Um, and he was the one that actually remen- recommended Three Floyds to us. and told Three Floyds about Pig's Trier. So, uh, you know, for an underground metal band i think it's uh way cool because if you have a show and you have the beer available you know the fans can kind of drink it and kind of get into the vibe and have fun 
but I also don't think it's a necessity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, um, that was always one of the things that I liked about, uh, the barbecue was that Guar actually had their own sauce to go with it. Right. Yeah. They barbecue sauce. I've been trying to get one of those made just because of the pig destroyer name, but yeah, you know, whatever. I'm trying to like keep <laughs> holding this cracker. I can't seem to find the angle I think is more flattering, but also I'm wearing my glasses. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a new, that's a relatively new thing for me. So it's not the reading glasses, which is even lamer. But. Yeah. I mean, in, uh, in preparing for this, uh, I was listening to some other uh, interviews with you from the past year or so. Uh, so especially when I got to, you know, asking about the beers, I was trying not to cover the same ground that, uh, that you already talked about on like Vox and Hops and uh, anything like that. Uh, but the right. one thing that jumped out at me from one of those interviews uh, was that you're talking about how you grew up, uh, you know, kind of in like a rural community. And, uh, you know, in those places, you end up uh, trying your first beer when you're like, you know, as a teenager and whatnot. <laughs> and I was listening to that and I was just like, yeah, that, that checks out. I had my first beer when I was in like preschool. <laughs> it was more like 11. Um, yeah. We were, me and my friends were hellions, man. Uh, there weren't a lot of kids that liked the music we liked. Uh we were like flash metal kids, and I kind of was the first one to branch out into punk rock. Um, and there wasn't a lot to do, man. There still isn't down there. I'm from Southern Maryland. And uh, we would just kind of get drunk and raise hell, like what we thought was raising hell. You know, we would run around the woods and push trees over and just dumb shit like that. Um, and, you know, when I went to college, I didn't really go to college. I more just kind of drank, uh, which is why I don't have a degree. A degree <laughs> um but yeah we that's you know we're very very from a very rural area and there's just nothing to do and when you're a bored uh punk metal kid and there's no one like you in your area uh you know you don't want to go to after school chorus class <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i um I had my first beer on accident when I was in like preschool because my uncle just left a Budweiser sitting around, but uh, and I was like thirsty or whatever. But uh, to your point about the uh, nothing to do in like rural areas, like I grew up in small town Kentucky, and I think when I was a teenager, there was like the movie theater loitering at like the mall or at the laser tag right. place or in the Walmart parking lot, or if you like knew someone who um had parties a lot when their parents were out of town or their parents just like didn't care uh you would go party at their place so we didn't have a mall in my entire county we would have to drive to charles county or annapolis um i didn't know you're from kentucky are you a king horse fan yeah yeah that was another thing Me that too. i was going to bring up because uh, you were the first person that i've ever uh run into outside of kentucky who knew about king horse yeah, um, again, those same friends I was talking about. Uh, I think we went to the first dancing tour and they were on that. And that's where we saw them and discovered them. Um, so I'm actually friends with the singer these days. Uh, I'm missing one seven inch and I don't have the uh, Too Far Gone CD because I don't have a CD player. I'm one of those vinyl guys. Uh, I don't know if you can see. I can't yeah. see, but yeah. Um, so, you know, they were just like a weird offshoot band and they were like not, you know, by the, my personal opinion is by the time most of those bands got their fourth records, they were really boring because they were repeating themselves. Um, and except for Metallica and Slayer and Anthrax and such. But, you know, like, I don't know, man, the fourth Exodus record is terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> shit like that. So, you know, that's when I kind of found punk because I was getting so sick of the same shit. Um, that's when I got into Smiths and The Cure and Depeche Mode and Echo and the Bunny Man and stuff. Um, and the Dead Kings and the Misfits and the Circle Jerks and Black Flag because I didn't want the same boring shit. Um, and there was a shitty, a lot, I'm sorry, a lot of shitty thrash records. I mean, bands that like, put out one record and never got another record because they were terrible. So, you know, we just, I think I got off point. 
Um, we just move on with, I didn't just move on with my life. I didn't want the same shit. Um, so yeah, but that's how we found King Horse. Ironically, when we saw them, that was a place near Baltimore. It was called Painter's Mill. And we saw them and Tanzag. And then next week we saw Slayer on the South of Heaven tour. And the place burned down like after that. It was like, you know, as a 15 year old, 16 year old, like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, pro- it was probably just bad wiring. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, um, the King Horse dudes had originally uh, toured with Danzig when he was still in Samhain because uh, Sean. When they were Maurice. Like, when they were yeah. Maurice. Yeah. 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 I didn't know how much of that stuff you talked to Sean about before. Um, I think that was mostly the weed turned me on to Maurice. And that was relatively recently. Um, I've talked to Sean about that. Uh, I've tried to talk to Mark Abramovich, but I don't think he's super interested. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he, so he Sean, took me a little bit to line up for. Um, I don't know if I've if I've uh, sent it to you before, but is I guess a decade ago now. I did like an oral history of uh, Louisville's punk and hardcore scene for Louisville Magazine. And, that uh, Endpoint, Endpoint, yeah. Rodan. Oh, I'm trying to think of some other ones, but there's like Malignant Growth was the band that the uh, the Abramoviches had been in originally, and uh, um, I think they were in that band. Uh, yeah there was uh there's uh the dick brains uh end table uh there's a lot of good bands in table <laughs> in table. table yeah that's terrible <laughs> that's awful it's an awful band name i uh i get really kind of bent out of shape when band names are so bad man i really like just irritates me and uh I get really bent out with shape, especially now when people have like the same band names of other bands. It's like, dude, all you got to do is put it in Google. Like, <laughs> you know, that's actually why Zealot is Zealot RIP because technically we would have had the, the band name first. Mike and Jason uh, have been trying to do Zealot forever and they were practicing like 15, 16 years ago. But like, who cares like i'm not emailing them and say hey we have the name so zelda rp it is i wanted of course like a lot more different i wanted like uh references to the shining or twin peaks references but whatever yeah that and uh when you've got like bands from different countries that have the same name and then the country that they're from is like noted after the band name that kind of drives me nuts too because it gets too confusing after a point well, I mean, it's way different at Pentagram from Chile, Pentagram from the U.S. because there wasn't the internet then. Yeah. So I kind of get that. I mean, Pentagram from Chile probably never left Chile until Maryland Death Fest. Uh, but now I never had as many game. shows canceled either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this year it's happening, man. <laughs> this year it's happening. So yeah. Well, I yeah now. Bobby has uh, convenient excuses to cancel shows if uh, <laughs> if there's a pentagram tour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not to not to browbeat the guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I uh, that was I think around the time that uh, the I had first like connected with you on social media. I remember you mentioning like King Horse or something in a post. And uh, being like really stoked about that. So, uh, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Sean Garrison's fucking scream. Like, yeah. You know, there's like, for Zealot, there's like some really definitive influences on how I prefer to do my vocals. Tim Singer from Dead Guy, Sean Garrison, Sean from uh, Swizz, that in the first Dag Nasty, he was on the first Dag Nasty record, in the Wid uh, from Integrity. Um, but, you know, I don't sound like any of those guys. I wish I did. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. I think it just kind of totally went off to your, on enough track for you. Yeah. No, did you uh, did you ever hear Sean's last band, I Have a Knife? Yeah, he sent me some of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were really good. I think I've listened to it a little bit, but, I you know. I have a hard time if I'm not in the car or at work and I've been unemployed for a while to listen to music. Um, 
like I was stack of records sitting by my record player that I need to go through and I just haven't. Sometimes I do or if I have people over, but you know, I have to be doing some I cannot sit and listen to music. Yeah. I have to be doing something else. Yeah. But sometimes it's really tough if I'm like put on the misfits or the Smiths and the Pixies when I'm working. I can't work because I'm too busy rocking out, you know. <laughs> Although it's hard to rock out to the Smiths. Yeah, it's uh I never could get into the Smiths. Um, how old are you? Uh, thirty-five. Yeah, so I'm about eleven years older. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that stuff was like a little bit more prevalent when I was around. Like, you would have kind of had to go search it out. Um, there were still people listening to it that I appreciated their musical opinion when I was a teenager. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think it. it my age too my main exposure to them has been through morrissey being kind of an asshole so yeah that's another, he's, he's, that's another barrier to entry yeah he's he's a complete twat i guess <laughs> i still like his music but i'm never gonna stick up for the guy uh i mean I, he's just a fucking idiot yeah <laughs> you know i mean he's no seth putnam but he should just shut his mouth and do his music that's what his fans want you know yeah. i've always thought that you know i've been asked in many interviews stuff about politics or life lessons um but you know i've always hated when movie stars or sports people or musicians give opinions about that i'm just some guy in a band like what does it fucking matter what you think i think about psychology <laughs> it doesn't you know or what I think about consumerism. I mean, I can go on for hours about that, but is that really going to form anyone's opinion? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, um, I had a conversation along those lines about Metallica with someone a few years ago um, where they were talking about how they, they wish that they knew more about like James Hetfield's like political leanings or something. I'm like, all that I need to know about what he thinks about anything I got from like ride the lightning and master of puppets and injustice for all. I don't care. Right. About anything That's, it. That. That's it. <laughs> I actually did an interview. Sorry. I keep putting my thumb over the camera. I did an interview with this guy from Spain who was a hardcore music journalist. And I think that, you know, that kind of industry is, you know, definitely, receding a lot and going away so he does like a podcast and he was like so what's your favorite song on um uh, ride the lightning he said trapped under ice a it's the fastest and b it's like that's when they started getting really socially aware and that's a, just a metal song it's not about suicide or nuclear war you know yeah it's not really a socially conscious song yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if anyone has anything that they really want to say about anything like that, uh, especially, you know, from the standpoint of being a musician, it's probably going to be in their music and you can probably figure it out from there. Well, with the exception of Burzum, but yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't really think you're talking about, unless he's talking about orcs as black people, <laughs> which he could be, who the fuck knows? Um, definitely a problematic person, though. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I hit a point a few years ago where as much as I liked black metal, uh, it's one of those things where it gets tiresome having to research everyone before I can decide if I can get into their music or not. Yeah, I feel that way. I mean, I'm older, so I kind of just like, you know, it, it's less so now. But when I was in my twenties, I'm like, I can just ignore that. But you know, that's when you can make fun of gay people on TV. And definitely had racial humor all the time. Um, and I'm not saying it was good or right, but it was definitely more accepted. Uh, I mean, I love like the first three version records, but it's it's hard for me to listen to that stuff now because of that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, my, you know, one of my favorite authors is H.P. Lovecraft, and he's a horrible racist. But I can justify it by saying, well, if I buy this book, he's not getting any money to spout more racist stuff. He's dead. So, you know, he can't. 
he's not benefiting from that money. Yeah. And I think in cases like that, there's enough fiction that's been created since then that is kind of derivative from his work that you can also kind of uh, enjoy those creations without maybe enjoying like any sort of perspectives that he like low key stuck into what he did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, man. Um, you know, it was hard for me to reconcile that too, but somebody pointed out the same thing. They're like, once I find out, I found out or put that together that he definitely was like super Connecticut blue blood white person that was terrified of any other race. Um, they're like, you're not giving him or even his estate money. He doesn't have an estate with his ancestors. So I'm like, all right, that's fine. Uh, but you know, supporting the outside racist, uh, it's hard for us too. When you said it's hard to screen bands, I have to do that before we play with the band. I don't know why. Yeah. But yeah. And that's tough, man. You don't always find out before, if you know what I'm saying. Um, in my eyes, I really kind of think Pig Destroyer uh, is kind of a punk band. And actually, I think Grindcore, which a lot of people don't care for, I think it's the next logical procession from punk uh, because the punk race was everyone trying to play faster. Well, Grindcore is way faster. And a lot of it is political or very DIY or DIY in spirit. So to me, it's always kind of been a punk sort of genre. Um, but you know, it's also got its metal aspect. So it doesn't matter to me what people say. If people say it's metal or punk, but I've always just kind of thought of it as, you know, like 75% punk and 25% metal, no matter what the sound is. So I don't know. I feel like I just keep going on tangents. You know, it's, um. To, to the point that you made, though, about uh, screening bands before you play with them, uh, I can remember when I was doing that uh, punk and hardcore article, uh, you know, a decade ago, uh, when I was talking to people who were in different bands, uh, a few people I like went to their houses and like they were showing me like all of the flyers and stuff from the shows. And uh, it's interesting to think back to then, like the number of shows that a band like Screwdriver would have gotten on with before anyone like knew any better. Well, everyone knew better. I mean, only yeah. their first record was, uh, their first record was really just kind of an only record. Um, but you know, I feel like at that time it's just kind of glossed over, but then when they kept doing it, <laughs> you know, it's not like, ah, we can kind of forget this one record. I mean, I don't know because it wasn't really ever in that scene. Um, I've always tended to stay away from like the actual uh, violence of that sort of stuff. Uh, I went to go see a band in Baltimore once and it was kind of the skinhead uh, versus punk versus the metalhead still. Uh, and it's kind of like the crossover times where the, a lot of the metalheads were getting the more punk stuff. And I saw a skinhead guy scalp a metalhead. And I was like, this is just not for me, man. Yeah. Uh, and even the band, I'm relatively friends with some of them. The next step up, they don't, it's not like that anymore. You know, uh, it might've been like that a little bit, but they were kids, you know? I feel like a lot of people don't understand that when Suicide of Fantasies were their first record, they were 18. Um, or DI or whatever, you know, this, a lot of those bands were kids and a lot of metal bands were, so they didn't know what they were really doing or talking about or knew the impact of what they were talking about. Yeah. But now uh, suicidal tendencies can afford a lot of Pepsi. Oh, Christ. That band has <laughs> not, been, not been good since like, I don't know. Maybe the nine, 92 <laughs> when that record came out, but I don't, some of it's pretty stagnant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, the, the staying power of that as a meme, though. <laughs> I mean, look, that first record is phenomenal. Yeah. But there's better punk records. That one just caught on, I think, because the ridiculous of uh, I Saw Your Mommy. 
the ridiculous of that song, rid- ridiculousness of that song. Um, you know, I feel like every kid in high school could always get a chuckle out of that, even still. Um, but yeah, I don't see their appeal in 2022. Yeah. I see their appeal in 1994. So. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I didn't check them out until like obviously way late in the game because I was uh, a lot younger. But uh, I think my entry point for them was from like one of the Pantera home videos because there was a, uh, a like a little segment on one of those where Phil Anselmo was dressed up like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not super, I'm not a fan of Pantera, but I got to give Phil's credit. I mean, I hate God would not be as well known as they are without Phil. Um, he did promote a lot of bands in the, in the 90s. Uh, but you know, his music for me is kind of representative of what I hate about a lot of me- me- modern metal. It's all squashed and compressed. It doesn't really have much life to it, you know? Yeah, yeah, and they were... Um kind of like the forebears of the 90s like tough guy metal yeah i mean if it wasn't for them i don't think sick of it all would have got signed a major label even though they're both mostly a hardcore man it's really tough for me when a fan comes and talks to me and it's like hey man do you like mashuga and i was like yeah <laughs> like no i do not but i don't want to be a dick to those kids and don't you know i don't always have time to debate them <laughs> <laughs> or the interest or the interest you know yeah yeah i've uh i've kind of reached this point where uh i know like enough that i can be nice to people who like heavy music that isn't like maybe in the vein right. of heavy music that i like but yeah it's a it's just kind of a waste of time to to get into arguments exactly. over it exactly i can't remember what point in my life that changed but in my 20s, man, the word poser was spattered from my mouth probably 40 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people say that I'm a poser and Pig Destroyer is posy. I mean, it's whatever. It's what you like. We've always, Pig Destroyer has always had the attitude that if you don't like it, don't buy it. We don't, we do this for us, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fans and having fans is great, but we don't do anything intentionally that we don't want to do yeah yeah because y'all were never really like the kind of band that uh that was you know we're doing this to try to get big and like go toward the world and all that no never um and that was mostly first first because of scott's job um he was on call a lot uh for the job he had you know from the beginning till when i first joined uh but you know he's got a wife and two kids and Right now, we're too old, except for our bass player, to, you know, fucking slug it out on the road, man. That's uh, something you got to be used to doing, and we aren't. We might be doing five days with Eunice Waste, and that's probably the longest run of dates we played in 15 years. Yeah. You know, it it gets really hard on your body the older that you get, because you start throwing (laughs) all those joints that you didn't know that you had, you know? Yeah, my back sound great anyway. So sitting in a van for eight hours is not helping that, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, like kind of at that point, it's always kind of just been for us. And if we don't like it or don't want to do it, we're not going to do it. Um, and we've never got offered big tours like Slayer or Behemoth or stuff like that. And that's cool. Uh, you know, sometimes when we do get offered some of that stuff now. I try to talk the band into it for because I think it's good for new fans to try to get some. But if it's not right, it's not right, you know, which is why we haven't done a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool when a band like Pig Destroyer gets uh, put on sort of like a one-off appearance for a festival or something too, because then it feels special that you got to see them. Like I've seen y'all play at like American University and that felt special because it was just like, oh, oh with Repulsion? Show to college. <laughs> with Repulsion, man, we were terrible yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah that was the first um, night i saw y'all yeah wow um so i can't really remember the question yeah so this is my point uh we used to play a lot a lot less than we even play now 
I mean, we play sometimes 20 shows a year, which is we used to play three shows every two years. So we're out there a lot more. But uh, I love it, man. It's so hard on my body, but because I'm 46, I'm like firmly middle-aged now. Um, but it's just great to be hot and sweaty and feel three, 400, 500 people into the same thing that you are at that moment, you know? Yeah. I mean, especially if uh, if it still feels, you know, just like true to what you want to do. Because I know that there's one of the interesting things that I've heard in the last several years uh, was regarding the Black Flag reunions. And, you know, anytime that Henry Rollins has ever been asked about that, he's just like, at my age, I would feel dumb singing those songs. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that flag does it. Uh, I think Keith Morris probably would need money. Um, but I don't think the other guys need money. I think it's just, hey, let's go do this for fun. Yeah. And I don't know Keith Morris's finances. So it could be fucking wrong. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's something to, I, you know, I've always thought the idea of like being in a band that tours and then you break up and doing a couple of union shows would be awesome. Uh, that seems like it would feel really good. But at the same time, you know, I think JR said it best. Like when we break up, we break up because that's it. We don't want to do it anymore the same way for whatever reason. And I kind of agree with that. Sometimes when something is done, it's just done, you know? Yeah, I don't. I, I agree. I don't feel a need to drag shit out just for a couple bucks or just for whatever. You know, sometimes yeah. it just bands run their course. I mean, there's, you know, that's it. Movie franchises run their course. You know, the first, second Halloween, the third one's great, but the rest are fucking terrible. You know, yeah, and then you get the endless reboots. Yes. It would have just been better to fucking kill it and have it be what it was. Yeah. Although I did really like the uh, the 2018 Halloween. Uh, which is that? That's uh, the one. That's the last one before Halloween Kills. Yeah. Shame on you. <laughs> that movie. Those I think got a little bit too goofy, but uh, 2018. There's a so there's a shot in 2018 Halloween that I like a lot because it's just a continuous shot of Michael going through the neighborhood. And so I think I I give that movie a lot of leeway just because of how much I like that sequence. Right. I mean, it's definitely really hard to do like a very uh, syncopated, uh, rehearsed, long track tracking scene. I mean, it's tough. I don't know if you saw the one in the first uh, True Detective, but it was incredible. Um, I'm a real like, uh, actually, me, Scott, Adam and JR are like super, super hardcore movie nerds. And the new bass player, Travis, is he's a lot younger, but he's starting to kind of fall in line. Um, I mean, like, Scott and I will talk about one movie for hours on end, you know, if we care for it. <laughs> yeah. And most of the time we agree. I think the last time we heart, we, we really didn't agree was the new, the reboot of Suspiria. I saw no. No reason for it. You know, all they had to do was make a movie about witches and they didn't. So, but anyway, I don't want to, I keep feel like I, I keep getting off track here. <laughs> I keep uh, feel like I'm just, ta- I'm just talking to you sitting at the bar. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the appeal of this format though, is you don't have to just uh, stick to one thing. You can just have a conversation, you know? I mean, look, I do most of the interviews for the band, uh, both bands actually. And it's cool, but a lot of times, and you're not doing it, it's like, where does your name come from? What does it mean? How, why don't you play too much? Blah, blah. And it's like, dude, Google it. I've answered these questions 25 fucking times <laughs> or more, you know? I try to keep it a little more upbeat and interesting, you know? Because who the fuck wants to watch the same shit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing for me is like, as a as a fan, I always thought that it was boring to just read the same like boilerplate questions in every interview. So I've always tried to avoid doing that uh, anytime that like I interview anyone. 
Uh, right. I think it's it's more interesting to try to present something that helps you feel like you learn something about like the the people that are involved, like as exactly. people. Yeah. Or the process or whatever it is. Um, like in DC, there's a few kids that don't really know me, so they just talk to me about pig destroyer. And finally, I was like, okay, how are you? <laughs> like, how is your life going? It's boring to me to talk about something from 17 years ago all of the time. Yeah. You know, I get, I get that they're fans and they just want to ask questions, but like, I'm a dude too. I'm in the same show as you, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think I kind of like worked that out of my system like early on. Cause when I was a teenager, anytime that I went to a show, if there was a chance to like meet people who were in the bands, I would try to do that. And it quickly kind of, uh, Put in yeah, you can kind of, these are, yeah, these are just normal you dudes. Can kind of, you can kind of pick up on it that it's like, oh, I got to answer this question about this song again. <laughs> even though you, even though that's the first time you asked it, you know, you can be like, I, mean, I remember when I met the band Sect, uh, which I love. It's Chris Colahan from Left for Dad and a bunch of other bands. He was like, so let me ask this question about second song, third record side to him like dude and chair was with me we're like we have no idea what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> but it's a little different because he's in a band that we really respect so it feels like um you know like we're kind of uh contemporaries in that in that case yeah i mean i think the uh the one thing that i've that's always stuck out to me that i've heard someone ask uh was when i was waiting to meet Henry Rollins, uh, I guess maybe like the first time I went to one of his shows, there was a person in front of me. So I like I'll, I'll get in these situations where by the time I get up to the person, I'm just like, I don't want to like belabor them with like any stupid questions because I've just heard right. every stupid question everyone in front you of me. You just turned 50 people yeah. in front of me. You do the same thing. Yeah. And like the person who was like right in front of me uh, gets up to him and they're like, do you remember me from the last time you came through? And he's like, no, I'm sorry. I do like a hundred of these I meet a, a lot, year. <laughs> I meet a lot of white dudes in black t-shirts. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've heard the uh, first two uh, Rollins Band's records, but they're fucking phenomenal. Uh, one's called Lifetime. Can't remember what the other one's called offhand, but they're fucking amazing. Yeah, I love uh, Wait. Yeah, I started checking out on the major label stuff, but that's pretty typical for me. Um, I think it's ingrained in my head that, uh, like, I have a friend of me, it's like, it's like, yeah, Blake only likes the first few records of any band. And it's kind of more just the punk thing where I'm like, ah, oh, that shit sucks. I didn't, I didn't even know if I've listened to that record. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Is the other, uh, the other uh, of the first two Rollins Band's records was uh, The End of Silence, right? No, that's way later. Oh, okay. Um, I can I can check if you want. Uh, I'd have to get up. And I got it. Google. Yeah, I got Google. I'll figure it out later. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, those those two are bad. And then the third one is turning on, and that is a live record with some other stuff. It's actually the first appearance of Tearing, which is on uh, End of Silence. Oh, okay. Yeah the um the thing that I always loved about I'm a record man is that uh. <laughs> They they didn't care about like just going overboard with the musicality of things. There's like these weird kind of like jazzy breaks in their music and mm -hmm. really good. So that that backing band was in a band with Greg Gann called Garn. So after Rollins quit or got kicked out or Black Flag broke up, uh, I guess is the right way. Um, he was still wanting to do music, so he called those guys, and they are right. They're seriously like talented musicians that can just do whatever. The drummer is fucking insane. I think by the end of Silence, it wasn't the same backing band. Yeah, yeah, you swapped out a, a few people here and there over the years, right? But like, I think I have uh, Minute Flag, which is Minute Men Black Flag. Uh, Rounds did this uh, four-song EP called Wartime. Uh, 
which was like him, a bass player and a drummer, and someone else but was no guitar. Uh, I've got almost all, you know, every Black Flag record. Um, there was something else he did that I, I used to have. It was pretty interesting, but I can't remember offhand. Yeah. Yeah, it was just uh, now that, that we've gone down this Rollins band track, I was just thinking about how they kind of had like a heavy funk thing going on. And I just had this thought go through my mind. It's like they were kind of uh, what the Red Hot Chili Peppers could have been if the Red Hot Chili Peppers were good. <laughs> so if you listen to the first two records, you'll hear a lot of Black Flag, but like less feedback. And Greg Ginn was like intentionally sloppy. So it's like that without all the, I guess, kind of punk aspects, like the feedback and the, the slop. It's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the the eras of that band that I'm more familiar with are just the ones where there was like more like a funk bass kind of thing going on. Yeah, like the major label stuff. Yeah. Which even then, that's still that stuff was still a lot different than the kind of stuff that major labels were interested in promoting at the time, too, though. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, you know, that that era was like a lot of uh, what I call alternative metal. Um, like things like Helmet and uh, uh, Trouble, I'm sorry, Therapy, uh, Faithful More, that type of stuff. Yeah. And I think just because of the name association and the grunge explosion of the 90s, they just took a, a risk on Rollins, man. So, I mean, it doesn't sound like anything else but Rollins, man. Yeah. I mean, it. Uh, all things considered, it didn't do too terribly either i mean it wasn't uh you know at, at like a huge level like they probably wanted but it i don't think yeah. they cared uh yeah. i think ron's had money left over from black flag i mean when he was in the band they didn't make any money but you know they repress and repress and repress those fucking records um so you know and ron's fans did pretty good you know they constantly toured in the early days uh so i i mean i don't know I'll ask Ian Mackay the next time I see him if he knows Rollins' finances. <laughs> yeah, oh. that'll go over well. He'll just stare at me. <laughs> I don't know him. Yeah. But I've met him a couple. I've met him a couple times. Uh, the drummer from Zealot owns an art gallery, and he does a lot of stuff with Ian for Fugazi, like art wise. Uh, like he has a couple shows with with Fugazi related shows. Um. The one cool thing I thought there was like a, I don't know what you call it, but it's a graph and it shows connections. So it's like, you know, uh, how Fugazi is connected to, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. How Fugazi is like connected to, uh, say, uh, the local band Frodus. And I was really stoked to find Pig Destroyer's name on there. Uh, it's, it was through enemy soil somehow, but yeah. yeah. But it was like, you know, probably, 10,000 bands on that. So it went from like, you know, Fugazi to Right to Spring or Right to Spring to Fugazi and the members of Right to Spring did these bands. That type of graph, I don't know what it's called. It was intense, man. Yeah. yeah well, um, I don't want to hold you for too much longer because uh, I've had you for about an hour now, but uh, yeah, thanks again for taking the time to do this. You got anything yeah, uh, of course. you want to promote? No, I mean, like, we're not really in a promotion cycle for anything buy the zealot record nobody's buying it so that'd be cool i mean it's not like a lot of money for us but it doesn't matter I'd like to make sure the label doesn't lose money so <laughs> that's 31g.com but yeah i'll put a link oh, to man, that in the uh in the description on this too great it's about time we got time to do this man yeah i um i was just thinking uh, well, I think off and on all the time that like I've lived in this area for like close to a decade now uh, and have like been acquainted with you and Lindsay both. And I'm like, right. I've never actually like have gone out of my way to try to hang out. And then I kind of feel bad about it. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing tonight? Come on through, man. Yeah, I um, actually need to run to the gym uh, after this. And then uh, of course we'll, you do. We'll do. We'll Look, do if, something. If you're like. If you're listening or watching, Roger is fucking huge, man. <laughs> he 
He wasn't when I first met him, but like the last 10 years, man, he's beast. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I ran into, into Lindsay at the Mastodon show because she was working merch. Working, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, uh, she told me. Yeah, I think that initially she thought that I was ignoring her, but I just didn't want to like yell over a whole bunch of people while I had a mask on. Yeah, it gets tiresome. Yeah. Uh, I don't like yelling over a whole bunch of people anyway. In a microphone at people, yes. But yeah, and then once you get up to the actual booth, you've got like the whole line of people behind you. So I'm just like, I don't want to hold these people up either. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Cool, man. Well, thank you very much. I got to go get some dinner. All right. Yeah. And uh, I'll hit you up sometime and uh, we'll see if we can figure out when to grab drinks sometime. Absolutely. Very good. My, run you, my, my, run you, my, run you,